So let me just organise myself. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I recognise some of you um, from, from, from various things and it, it, it's, it's great to, to do that and some of you I don't know. Um, so my name's Andrew Farmer. Uh, I'm a GP. Uh, that's uh, where I work uh, for one day a week at the moment, South Oxford Health Centre. Um, I'm based at the Department of Primary Care uh, Health Sciences, which is in the old uh, outpatient building at the Radcliffe Infirmary. Um, and I've been working there, f oh, well, I've been working as an academic for the past 15 years. Before that, I was a full-time GP. So, as you might imagine, most of my work uh, these days involves people with long-term conditions um, or chronic diseases, heart failure, uh, um, chronic obstructive airway disease, diabetes, asthma, these are heart disease, these are all problems that, that people um, uh, have to, to, to live with and, and um, uh, find ways to cope with. Um, I just thought I'd show you some of the current projects that I'm involved with. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through them in detail because some of them I talk about, but um, you know, there are the projects mainly around diabetes, supporting them through mobile technologies, uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. Uh, there are some projects around looking at which drugs work for people with diabetes. Uh, there's a recent project we've been doing around the mobile internet uh, platform, and then some more stuff on computers and, and, and diabetes. Um, so I'm very fortunate to, to work with a number of, 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 of absolutely great colleagues. Uh, I've been working with uh, Lionel Taroshenko, who some of you have made, may have heard talk, uh, who's uh, now the head of engineering, but a very eminent uh, engineer who's done a huge amount of the, the um, technology development work that, that uh, I'm sort of dealing with here. Uh, and some of his colleagues, people that have uh, been his uh, postdoctoral and, and, and uh, uh, doctoral students. Um, I have a number of clinical colleagues, only some of whom I've mentioned here across uh, the Oxford University hospitals. Uh, I have some great methodologists that I work with because the sort of work I do is, is largely around clinical trials um, and uh, it's very important to have good support for, for that. And then uh, I work with, with colleagues really across, uh, well, across the globe, um, uh, Sydney, Cape Town, Johannesburg, um, uh, I've got colleagues in the States, um, but also sort of elsewhere in the UK and do a lot of work with them. So my research program really involves helping people to make better use of um, uh, monitoring devices um, in diabetes, for example, blood glucose meters, to help them control their diseases. Um, and uh, using computers uh, to help people monitor what they're doing, to be able to provide feedback and education, uh, and then perhaps even giving people hints and tips around making better use of their, their medicines and other aspects of the ways they, they can look after themselves. So I think I should probably start by asking you how to put your hand up if you've got a, if you've got a mobile phone with you. There you go. I mean, you're all connected. Uh, put your hand up again if that's a smartphone. <laughs> so you're all connected to the internet. How many of you use it to send messages or use the internet? OK, a slightly smaller number. But you know, you've all actually got with you the potential to be connected to the entire globe, uh, to computers that uh, uh, can uh, provide you with data uh, from practically anywhere provide you with knowledge about what's happening um, and to uh, link you up with people um, and to provide what I'll call predictive algorithms. We'll come, 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 come back to them. So, I mean, it's a great time to actually be doing this sort of work. Ten years ago when we started, um, well, I mean, I think I first started using the, the internet um, in about 1993 when the World Wide Web was first developed. It's sort of hugely uh, progressed since then. And what's changed over the last 10 years is really all of these things have come together. The, the phones, the communication technologies have come together with the huge power of computers, with the huge databases, uh, and also the sort of computing power that can actually use this data and combine it in ways that actually make predictions about what's likely to happen. And, uh, 
the uh, predictive algorithms are, are one part of that. Um, the challenges that we have to face uh, in, in, in the health service are integrating that data with the electronic health record in real time. It's a real sort of block with this. Um, the monitoring aspects, actually making sure that the data we collect from people is accurate and relevant and in, well, yeah, relevant, and it sort of informs the things we want to inform. Uh, and then, you know, the challenges of, of people don't just have one disease when you're talking about long-term conditions. I, I mean, I've, I've sort of looked after people with diabetes for, 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 for many years, and I've done research into them, into, into the sort of problems that they experience and how to, to help them. But uh, of those people, the vast majority have other problems that they're dealing with. Um, and so you can't just say to someone, um, okay, I want to, to, to you to tell me all about your diabetes and we're going to help you with, that, with your diabetes, but actually I know you've got hypertension as well, well I can't really help you with that. Um, you'll, you'll just have to carry on. You have to find ways to, 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 to manage all of those things together. Uh, so health apps. Um, this is what you encounter if you, if you go onto the, 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 the app store. This is just the, the, the front end of it. Uh, there are probably about 165,000 health-related apps on, on the uh, uh, Apple and the Google uh, uh, app stores. Uh, and they've been downloaded about 1.7 billion times. Um, so, you know, why isn't it all happening? You know, why isn't this, this running? Well, you know, the vast majority of these uh, applications are not very useful uh, or even don't work at all. Um, so I haven't got the, the statistics with me, but it's something around um, a tiny proportion of these are downloaded, uh, a tiny proportion of those uh, are used more than once, uh, and then the proportion of those that are actually useful is, 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 is even smaller. Most of these apps that you can see here are around health, uh, and promoting health, so they're, um, you know, yoga or monitoring uh, uh, exercise. So um, they're, they're very relevant for, for, for people who want to perhaps get fit. Um, uh, and I think some of you uh, may have sort of, you know, recorded your step count, for instance, and sort of got some feedback about that. The difficulty is how long do you carry on doing it? I mean, most people I know sort of manage to record their steps for, for a few weeks. Uh, and then, for whatever reason, get as much information out of it as, th as they can and stop using it. So there isn't a sort of, um, th th there is a need to build these, these applications, build the uh, ways of collecting data. Um, nonetheless, the, 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 the market for these is predicted worldwide, globally, to, to reach about 15 billion pounds spent on these uh, over the next uh, uh, couple of years. Now, what is, is sort of um, really interesting is, 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 is the issue. So, you know, these are the sort of figures uh, for, for the mobile internet. Just show you how quickly it's changing. Um, you know, in 2013, tiny numbers of tiny revenue from uh, um, apps uh, now building up. Uh, and, you know, that's pretty much across the, the, the Western world with that. This is what I wanted to sort of stress. I mean, the bit that I'm interested in is long-term conditions. So these are really just a very small proportion of those uh, thousands, to hundreds of thousands of apps. The vast majority are around fitness, lifestyle, data, nutrition. The disease-specific ones are really a very small proportion of that. Um, and that's where I think um, there's, there's a real potential for doing some further work. So what I wanted to do was really just talk a bit about the research that I've been involved with, with, with colleagues here in Oxford and with the, with the uh, biomedical engineering department. This is perhaps a, a recent sort of paper, but it sort of tells you why we're interested in this, this you know, in, 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 the, in the area of people who have long-term problems. The question is, who gets admitted to hospital and can you predict it? Um, so this is a paper which, which took a, a, a large number of people who um, actually experienced admissions to, uh, well, no, it was just a database of, of, of people from, from, from general practice. 
uh, and they looked in that and tried to predict who would be admitted to hospital. So they, they, they took data from other studies and put together those that had been admitted before, those that were elderly, those that had got multiple conditions, those that were frail, uh, and they developed a risk score. Uh, and on the, the, uh, the, the bottom part of those graphs, uh, is, is, is they've, they've divided that up into, into the risk score. So the further right you are, the, the, the higher your risk of being admitted to hospital is. And then they compared that against actual risk of being in, admitted to hospital. In other words, they were, they were testing how accurate their, their, their um, uh, predictions were. And you can see that actually they can be very accurate. Uh, you, you can sort of predict a, uh, from uh, the sort of data that's already there in the health record a pretty high proportion of, of, of those that are going to be at risk of those that are going to be admitted. Um, and so many of these people are people with long-term conditions. So what we were, um, what we've focused on is this group because they have a, an increased risk of hospital admissions, they have an increased risk of events and deaths, uh, there is the potential to uh, guide uh, management in, in terms of, of, of trying to predict events and you can actually try and pull out vulnerable groups of the pop population uh, who one might be able to institute better care management. And the sort of innovations that we're dealing with are around sensors fully integrated into people's lives signal processing, uh, being able to take the data from these individuals and integrate the, the multiple sources of, of, of data. So this is where we started. So this was 2003. Um, and uh, I don't suppose anyone remembers 2.5G. Um, so I think we're now on 4G and coming up to 5G. But, but um, uh, 2G wasn't the internet. Uh, on mobile phones um, and so around 2002, 2003 the possibility of, of sending data through a mobile phone was developed and on the back of that with, with, with colleagues um, uh, Vodafone funded a, a project, uh, a collaboration between the Diabetes Department, Engineering and Primary Care uh, in which um, uh, the, the engineers developed uh, a way of linking, well they developed a Bluetooth cradle to put around a glucose meter which enabled us to link mobile phones to, to blood glucose meters. So we sent out a, we, we did a large trial which was uh, carried out with a um, uh, hundred uh, young adults with type 1 diabetes. Um, this is a group of people who regularly have to adjust their, their blood glucose levels um, and the advantage of actually being able to to uh, send that data to a nurse who could look in real time uh, at their data on a on a web browser uh, and then give them advice was was really um, well you know it was at that time revolutionary so it was the first trial done in this area so the sort of system that was set up is on the top left there the the um, the, the, the patient would have their mobile phone and, and blood glucose meter when they tested that would be sent to uh, up into the internet through through the mobile phone uh, that will be stored on a computer uh, and also looked at by a nurse and then um, you can't see it on that one it was on uh, what we uh, you, you can see it on here what we then did was actually send back immediately to the the mobile phone um, information about what those blood glucose readings were in relation to previous so we, we charted out data to, to try and give guidance to people and those are the i mean those are the results which if you you want to pour out them or look at them afterwards i'm happy to to, to show you but what we did what what, what that shows is that um, uh, the people who actually had the, the, the monitor as opposed to just having a mobile phone and blood glucose meter on its own without that link, um, the people who got the system kept monitoring for the trial. Uh, those that didn't have it, their monitoring fell off and that's the, the bottom left of those. And then what happened was those that had actually got the system, again, we, their, their blood glucose levels dropped down below the threshold uh, which we'd set for them. Um, so it was a really good example of where you actually provide people with some mobile technology, you can actually help them to um, uh, improve their control. We did the same sort of thing actually then with, with a group of people with type 2 diabetes. So these are, tend to be older people uh, who uh, um, 
a proportion have to take insulin to control their diabetes. Um, but we were doing the same thing uh, to actually help uh, get, their insul get their insulin levels right. And you can see from the, the diagram on, on, on the left hand side that uh, uh, we managed to, to reduce blood glucose levels. Um, uh, uh, both uh, the, the, the um, uh, normal blood, glu the blood glucose levels during the day and the fasting levels uh, as, a, as a result of, of having that system. And these people didn't need to come into the surgery. They didn't need to come into the hospital. They were just doing it over the phone with a nurse. Now, where did all that go? Well, it's gone in two directions, really. Um, there are people who've used those sorts of technologies now, um, uh, firms that have taken up the, those, those technologies, and, and there's a huge amount of work around what's called the artificial pancreas. So uh, there are um, firms who are linking up blood glucose monitors that are implanted uh, with computers, with insulin pumps, and it's now possible uh, if you have uh, type 1 diabetes that's a bit unstable, so yeah, type 2 diabetes that's a bit unstable, to be able to, to, to set this up at night, go to bed, and, and the computer sort of delivers enough insulin to keep your blood glucose levels under very good control. It's not yet sophisticated enough to be able to sort of handle the variation during the day when you're running around eating and so on, but certainly uh, you know, in ensuring you know, people who, who perhaps tended on, on their previous sort of treatments to, to um, go very low at, at night, it can control those or people who for whatever reason were finding it difficult to control it. That is all progressing, uh, will be developed in commercial systems and uh, is currently being uh, looked at by the regulatory authorities for licensing and use in, in, in real life practice. The other bit, which is sort of using it more widely uh, and, and, and making it available to, to, to people, has gone a bit more slowly. It's actually gone very fast in the States, where uh, the health system is set up uh, in, in a slightly different way, and, and there are the financial barriers in being able to sort of say, okay, you know, here's a, here's a system which is going to connect you to the nurse and will reduce your use of services. But in the NHS, it's gone much more slowly with that. Because I think what we did with, with all of this was, was we, we made the, the, the nurses work a bit easier. Um, we made the, it very convenient for patients, but what we didn't do was sort out the hospitals in the middle. Um, uh, we didn't sort of change the way that the syst health system works. And I think that's one of the, the issues that, that we need to, you know, I, I hope we can sort of talk about a bit at, uh, at the end of this. Um, reason I've put that up is, is these are the sort of systems that have been tested in the last sort of <coughs> 10 years or so. Now, I'm a GP, so when I see someone at home, um, I don't know what you'd feel like if you, if you sort of, you know, were, were suddenly given all of these devices to, to, to sit at, to, you know, to have at home and, and to sort of monitor yourself. It looks pretty intimidating, uh, and that's what patients tell us as well. Um, it, it, it's all you know, a, a bit too sort of dramatic. It sort of labels you as having a disease. So we moved on uh, to, to look, at a, look at the condition of con chronic obstructive airways disease. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know anything about it, it's a worldwide problem, three million deaths a year. Uh, it's hugely disabling uh, in terms of, of severe breathlessness, uh, re recurrent coughs, infections, costs a, a fortune for the, for the NHS because these people um, uh, are frequently admitted to hospital to, to, to manage their condition. There are things that can be done. So medicines can actually help relieve the symptoms of, of, of chronic obstructive airways disease. Um, the types of medicines obviously depend on, on how severe the COPD is and people actually have to take a combination of medicines, uh, particularly when they have a flare-up of their condition. So what we developed was this, which is actually a tablet computer with a, an app on it um, to try and help people manage their condition better. Um, so. This is, so we, there are a number of principles that we had with, with using these systems. Um, one is that they have to be really easy to use. 
Um, and you can see there, we've actually taken away the, the, uh, the sort of front end of a, of a, of a traditional tablet. And um, you know, really, just, you've just got four, four big squares that you can tap onto. Uh, and these are the things that we, were, that, we were, that we could collect. Data on collecting symptoms, um, uh, information about looking after yourself, um, uh, reviewing data, and then uh, looking at messages from the nurse. So again, very, very straightforward and simple. This is a little bit more sort of information about it, and, and you can see here, um, uh, for example, uh, on the uh, top left-hand corner, these are the sort of information that people could get from that. So you could actually get uh, a personalised video about how to use your particular medicines. So the, the nurse who is managing an individual patient could actually set on the web browser which medicines people were on, and then that would download the, the, the videos uh, for that particular medicine information about activity and exercise, how to stop smoking if that was a problem. Um, and you can see from uh, one of the, 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 the uh, people that were involved in the development of, of this, it is actually um, all, all you have is the tablet computer and then a, a little black thing which is a pulse oximeter to measure your oxygen saturation and pulse. So it's much less intimidating uh, to use and also you can um, play games on it or you can send messages to your uh, grandchild or you can Skype them or whatever. So it's actually part of your day-to-day -day life and not, not all medical technology. So when we developed this, um, it was actually developed in a very careful way. So we, we actually worked with, with, with groups of people who got the condition and they actually told us uh, whether what we were doing was right, <laughs> whether it was usable, whether it was relevant to them. Um, and, and so all of that's written up in a series of papers. And I just wanted to sort of stress the sort of difference that having lay user feedback made to that system. So, you know, we changed the, 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 the background icons. You know, they said, well, you, you can't have that picture on it. You've got to have something different on it. Um, they helped us actually make the way we ask questions much clearer. And that was really helpful. Um, they helped us get the sort of sequence of questions right and um, we also asked people about their mood because one of the, you know, not surprisingly when you, when you have a long-term condition uh, you find yourself um, uh, potentially with, with, with low mood and, and there are things that are possible to do with that if you pick it up so we actually did uh, include an option for that and uh, we had some very clear feedback on how often to do that and we finished up doing it monthly. So we carried out a trial, so we actually had 110 people using that system, um, 66 people, so 110, uh, 60 people using um, uh, or were just, just following normal care. Um, and some of the things we found from that was that um, uh, people really enjoyed the self-management aspect of it. They've, they found that the things that, that they, so let me give you an example. People at the beginning of the study said, I don't really understand my condition. It just suddenly seems to get worse some days, others, it was, you know, others better. I couldn't get any pattern from it. After people had used it, they said, actually, you know, just seeing it all charted out when I record my symptoms, when I record my oxygen saturation, uh, I can actually see um, when I start to get unwell, these change, and actually normally it gets better in a couple of days. Uh, and if it's not better in a couple of days, I know that I need to ask for help or I need to do something. And what we found, uh, and the other thing, is, is that people used it. Um, so 80% of the people used it every day, uh, which is a huge difference to most of the telehealth uh, uh, sort of studies that, or study uh, systems that are, that are out there. There was a 17% reduction in hospital admissions in, in that group compared to the control group. Uh, there were fewer primary care consultations and people said their general health was better. Um, so it needs repeating in a larger, larger study or other work needs to be done to confirm those findings. Um, uh, but we think with this, something as simple as that, which is probably an order of magnitude of costs lower than other systems that have been produced, um, needs more work done on it. It's also sort of started us, well not started, it's, 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 it's we can continue to, to do the work that we, we wanted to with this. So we've actually got a vast amount of data from these people and that we are using to 
try and work out who gets sick and when, so predictive algorithms. Um, I'm sorry about the jargon, task shifting amongst clinicians. What that actually means is that the staff who used this said, look, it's, you don't need a, a specialist respiratory nurse looking at this data. Um, the district nurses and practice nurses were really keen to, to look at that, that when we interviewed them and talked to them about it. So actually you've got this group of people who are currently uh, being looked after partly in primary care, partly in, in the hospital. Um, and there are ways that they can actually, um, the, the care for these people can actually be simplified even in primary care. Um, but because it's all electronic, because it's all accessible, you can easily get extra support all the way up the chain. So you can get an experienced respiratory nurse looking at this data, being able to talk to the, the practice nurse about someone if there are problems. So it's, it's a, a real way of, of trying to sort of get more of a team and more integration in, in the work that's being done. I'm going to move on and I can talk about that at the end if you want to ask questions. But the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was some work done on gestational diabetes with Lucy McKillop and Jane Hurst who are uh, from the Women's Centre here. So gestational diabetes, as you may know, is a condition that uh, during pregnancy people uh, start to develop high blood sugars. Uh, and the consequence of that is that uh, the babies tend to be, uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, can be larger than they should be. That causes problems uh, at birth. Um, uh, and also from the point of view of the, the, the women, there are increased risks of developing diabetes afterwards. Currently what happens for these, to these women is that they actually come up to hospital every two weeks during their pregnancy uh, because they both need their, their pregnancy managing but they need their blood glucose levels managing. Um, so what uh, we've done with this system, the system that was developed was to actually uh, allow the blood glucose management side of things to be taken out and managed separately uh, using uh, a, 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 an app on, on a phone. We actually used, uh, uh, those are, those are I, iPhones, aren't they? But we actually sort of started it off with a, with a Google, uh, with, a, with an Android phone, and um, it's now extended onto to, to an iPhone. Um, but it's again, it's the same system that we developed in, in 2003, essentially, um, that you have a blood glucose meter linked to a mobile phone. Uh, you can then tag the blood glucose lead readings um, uh, and a nurse midwife uh, can look at those and adjust uh, blood glucose levels. Um, uh, and of course, because the technology has moved on, um, it's actually much smarter, uh, it's much more attractive. Um, so we've just finished two pretty large studies. One was a pilot with 50 women, the other was a, a main study with, a, with 100 women. And, you know, people thought it was fantastic. Um, they didn't, well, you know, it's, th th they used it for the, for, for, for the entire pregnancy and um, they only had to come up to hospital every four weeks uh, <coughs> rather than every two weeks. Um, and we also found as a result of using this that we were adjusting people's blood glucose levels much more quickly. So this is what the sort of woman had on, on, on their phone. Um, uh, they could actually look at their past readings, look at graphs, they could ask the midwife to call them uh, and they could check their blood glucose uh, and, and just use that in, in the way I, I was demonstrating. So this is the sort of displays that they had which helped uh, them see what was happening. Uh, they were colour coded so they could actually sort of get an idea of which times of the day their blood glucoses were less well controlled. Um, and they could also look at the difference between uh, pre and post, you know, um, blood glucose readings before and after meals, which is obviously uh, one thing that, that can lead to problems. Um, it's rather a sort of uh, um, f busy diagram, but what it shows uh, is, is the, um, the, the lines that go up and down uh, are the blood glucose readings and you can see that's very variable but actually if you look at the purple line that's just a, a moving average of those uh, and you can see that it goes along and then drops off dramatically uh, and that's because the green line is going up which is the insulin dose. So what you can see with that is, is that as a result of noting the high blood glucose levels the, the midwife has uh, recommended increasing uh, doses of insulin to actually control, you know, to help the woman control what was happening. And you can see that over a very short period of time, uh, that sort of three to four weeks, 
it's actually brought down uh, well into the normal range. And that frequency of adjustment just wouldn't have been possible without this sort of app um, and system available. Um, that is a system that um, is now being rolled out to uh, the raw barks, Milton Keynes, Slough, and the aim is to actually roll it out still further. Um, uh, and then clearly the sort of trial results uh, uh, are in, in the process of analysis at the moment. But you know, what we do know about this is it's hugely acceptable um, and at a minimum can actually cut the number of visits um, safely. <coughs> I'm going to tell you about the low tech side as well. Um, so this is some work that we did in um, South Africa. Um, so let's not worry about that. We wanted to do some, some, uh, some work with, with mobile phones um, in, 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 a, in a low resource setting. So we visited uh, a primary care clinic in the Bontehevel Langa township, um, which is a, a very low uh, socioeconomic um, uh, setting uh, and um, one of the advantages of the, the, well you know one of the sort of fantastic things that they can do with healthcare in South Africa is they do actually look after people with long-term conditions they provide them with medicines so there is a huge warehouse uh, uh, out near Stellenbosch which packages uh, medicines for everyone with a chronic condition in the Western Cape province huge place you know it's the size of about three football fields uh, full of machines that just pour um, medicine, you know, that pour tablet uh, packs in, into, into boxes for people. It's run by computers. So what you, you get is people can actually get a supply of their medicines to pick up from their local clinic every month. Uh, and on the, the left-hand side, that's the, 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 the clinic, um, uh, the, the, the pharmacy <coughs> at the clinic. On the right-hand side are the boxes containing the medicines. Now, unfortunately, that those boxes are not the ones that have just been delivered for people to pick up. Those are the boxes being sent back because people haven't picked them up. Um, and so what's happening is that the medicines are prepared, but about 50% of them aren't picked up. So what we wanted to do was to actually use a, a relatively low-tech solution, SMS text messages, to try and support people collecting their medicines. Um, uh, and the idea was that we could sort of send messages which gave practical um, advice about taking medicines, about collecting them, and uh, uh, helping people sort of make better use of the, the health system. Um, so we ran a trial, um, uh, and we we took um, uh, thirteen hundred people in the uh, Vanguard Health Clinic, serving those communities, all of whom who had high blood pressure. In fact, the the Vanguard Clinic looks after six thousand people with high blood pressure. So we only took about a six, um, just over a sixth of them. Um, and we followed them up for a year. So the system that we developed, and I haven't shown the sort of technology side of it, but it was um, a whole sort of clinic solution. So we, we collected people's mobile phone numbers, checked that that was actually the right phone by sending them a message straight back. We had a data collection system that was integrated into that and integrated into, into the cloud. And then that system sent the messages on a pre-organized basis. So all of, all of the message sending was done automatically. Um, and we linked it up to the, data, the clinic data set because they actually did record when people, or the clinic computer records of when people were due to be collecting their medicines. So we managed to, to link that in so we could send reminders saying, your medicines are going to be here tomorrow, do come along. Uh, and if you don't pick them up, um, uh, if people then didn't pick them up, we'd send a message saying, we missed you, is there a problem? Can, can, you know, can you come in at another time? So this is the result of the study. The, we basically, if you look at the left-hand side, that's a drop in blood pressure, um, and we drop the blood pressure of these people by about two millimeters of mercury. Now, that may not sound a huge amount, but actually on a population basis, that translates into um, a reduction in, in heart disease uh, and strokes. And we increase the pickup of medicines by about 25%. Um, so many more of those medicines are being used, and that was really a a very simple system which we think we can actually improve and, and develop further. Now, the question is, can we do the same sort of thing in the NHS? Um, this is just um, uh, some data that we published at the beginning of the year 
um, which is taken from a large database. It's taken from something called the CPRD, which is actually uh, about eight million, the, 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 based on the records, general practice records of about eight million people. Um, and so we picked out from that uh, uh, people who'd got um, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, and, and then looked to see how often they were picking up their medicines. Because of course, you've got in the electronic health record, you, you know when people pick the medicines up. If they're on a monthly prescription, they should be picking it up every month. But surprise, surprise, actually some people pick it up less often, which means they're probably not taking all their medicines. Um, so we looked at that. Um, and what we found was actually, if you, take, if, if you're, if you pick up less than 80% of the medicines you're meant to pick up, you get roughly half the impact from those drugs. Um, so in other words, you, you expect a drop in blood glucose if people, if you take of, of about, um, without getting too technical, about, of, of about half uh, um, a percent hemoglobin A1C. If you only take less than 80%, you'll only get a, a half of that drop. Um, and that's excluding those that you can spot who have stopped taking their tablets altogether. So when you look at that, uh, as a graph, what you can see on the left-hand side, those are uh, on the, on the right-hand side, those are people that are taking their medicines as they should be, or as they were recommended and as they agreed to take it. They've got a very good response to the medicines. But as you go to the left, those are people who are taking less and less of the medicines over a year. Um, uh, so you know, on the le far left, you've got people taking 70% or less of their medicines, and they get a much, much smaller drop in their. Um, uh, blood, blood sugars over that time. So we've gone on to do further work. We're doing some, some similar work, text messaging uh, in um, South Africa again. We're, we're move, moving to Soweto and also moving to Lalongwe in Malawi. So these are very, uh, Malawi is probably uh, one of the sort of 10 poorest countries in the world. And so we think, but there are medicines available. So we think that actually using this sort of system, because people have mobile phones, just as you all have mobile phones, that we can actually leverage some of that um, uh, technology that's already out there to actually help these people. And we, we are also funded to do the similar thing in the UK. It's going to need to be on a very different level. Uh, we're going to make, need to make use of smartphones and the technology of that. But the basic idea of actually engaging people with their medicine use um, uh, and to uh, catch people who are sort of taking, using their medicines is, is, is where we're going with that. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about other, other forms of, of technology around glucose monitoring. So, what, you know, people with diabetes, um, it's really important that they, they, um, they are supported in, in being able to lower their blood sugar to, to a level that, that's safe. High, high blood sugars cause long-term complications, they cause eye damage, uh, kidney damage, uh, foot damage, and one of the ways that you can actually tackle that is to ha have, a, have a target. You sort of know what you, you've got to be aiming for and then to measure to see whether you're, you're getting to that target. And there are some really interesting technologies out there. So there's something called flash monitoring where you can actually put a little needle under the skin which stays there for two weeks. Uh, and then you just sort of hold your mobile phone above it and it reads it. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that's going to really change uh, the way people look after themselves and change the information that's available to these technologies. So they've already shown, I mean, so, you know, the, the, the results of a study recently published on that show that on average people are actually taking tests, you know, 15 times a day. These are people, again, with type 1 diabetes who've got, um, uh, who have to adjust quite complex um, combinations of insulins. Um, but it certainly shows up with, with lower rates of, of low blood sugars, people sort of, you know, fainting or, or getting problems. Uh, and there's also a technology called uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, that's currently available, is often used for a few days, but they've now uh, developed 90-day implantable sensors that can be used. Um, they have to, I mean, both of those, you still have to prick your finger occasionally because that's a little bit more accurate and you can just make sure it's calibrated properly. Um, but there's a huge amount more technology coming through with this. Now, what I wanted to just sort of do is, is, is just go back to the question that I asked at the beginning, which is, you know, how are mobile and digital devices shaping the future of healthcare? Um, I mean, my, 
guess, or my opinion, and I'm interested in yours as well, is, is that design is currently pretty technology driven. Um, and the engineering solutions are, dri are, are driving, uh, you know, the engineering ideas are driving the, the solutions that are coming out. So, you know, there are things like Apple Watches and, and you know, iPhones, which are beautifully designed and work for, for large numbers of people. But they are around innovation and showing great promise. But in terms of actually being applied to the sort of problems that I've been talking about, they, 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 that hasn't happened yet. Um, so I think the task of researchers is to bring this technology to bear on, on the real clinical problems. Uh, and the BRC, um, uh, of which I'm here uh, representing, can actually brings engineers into contact with clinicians like myself and can actually help some of this work happening. In the process, of course, there's all sorts of questions here that um, uh, we haven't really sort of talked about, about uh, usability, you know, can you use these systems? Uh, equity, you know, are you actually sort of providing these to, to everyone who, who might benefit? Or, uh, um, you know, are there some people who sort of drop through the, drop between the cracks on these? Value for money, is it a good use of NHS resources? And then of course the issues about privacy and safety. Now, this is um, a survey that's recently been carried out. It was in the States, but I don't think it's terribly different to here. 1,400 clinicians, 1,100 patients. You ask people about their preferences for digital tools for medical diagnosis. In other words, do you think using this sort of technology that I've been talking about today is a good idea for diagnosis? Nearly 40% of patients say, yes, fantastic idea. You ask clinicians about 13%. Um, and then you sort of say, ask it the different way around. You say, do you feel uneasy about using technology for diagnosis? Very, you know, small proportion of patients say they feel uneasy, but 28% of clinicians say they feel uneasy. I think the most interesting thing about that is the gap between the, the sort of opinions of, of, of patients, users, and, and, and the profession. And it's not clear what those numbers mean. Um, does it mean that, that actually um, patients don't have all the information and don't understand the subtleties of this and how dangerous it might be? Um, or is it that clinicians are actually resisting something that's going to change the way they work? And I think there's a, there's a real potential there for things to get bogged down. <laughs> and I think one of the challenges uh, that, that an organisation like the Oxford BRC can, can help with is to actually bring clinicians and uh, patients together to discuss these sorts of issues, to actually understand what the, the, the drivers are, and to actually focus down in detail, because you ask a broad question like that, uh, it's very difficult perhaps to understand it. But nevertheless, I suspect you probably recognise some of the, you know, even, even for sort of specific issues, you can recognise some of those, those things. Um, so, I wanted to just highlight all the ways that, that um, people can get involved uh, with the, the technology in, in, in long-term conditions. So, I mean, I think it's huge, and I actually took this list from the grant application uh, that we just recently had funded, because we are actually doing all of these things with a group of um, 11 patients as a steering group, and considerably more people will be involved in focus groups, user, what I call co-design, where you actually get an engineer and a patient together to, to um, sort of say, well, you know, how is this working? But there are issues around identifying unmet, unmet, unmet needs, uh, receiving reports on progress of the work, reviewing and contributing to the research design, providing clear information uh, to research participants, um, contributing to uh, interpretation of the research findings, and disseminating, <coughs> going out and saying, look, you know, I thought this was, was really important. So these are the challenges, um, and I've already alluded to some of these, but um, uh, you know, we're not going to sort of develop this further unless we actually get these sort of devices accurately monitoring data. So for example, in the chronic obstructive disease study um, work that I cited, we, we, we measure people's oxygen saturation, how much oxygen is in their blood. Um, previous studies have really just sort of stuck the 
probe on, on people's fingers and then taken the data stream from that and then used it. Now the problem is that 50% of the time that, that's inaccurate because for whatever reason it's not put on quite the right way uh, or people move their finger and restrict the blood flow. So the technology that we used with that included analysis of the waveforms which allowed us to tell patients to stop moving their finger or to reposition the probe or to just hang on a bit uh, because it needs a bit more uh, time to, to measure it. So accuracy and ease of use is really important. Uh, what sort of feedback uh, is most likely to lead to, to people to change their behaviour? So we work with health psychologists to, to, to make sure that, that that really helps as well as our patient groups. Um, and then the health service I think will need to change with, in response to all of the, these um, developments. Um, uh, and, and I'm not sure I want to sort of embark on, on, on talking about that now. And then, of course, there are the issues about personal information and uh, sending this sort of data into the uh, ether and, and how that's protected. Um, and then the issues around actually using people's data to, to modify advice and support. So I'm going to come back to that slide and I'm going to leave it up because I really hope that might inform some of the questions and discussion. And I just wanted to show you, that's my research team to whom I'm hugely grateful. And, uh, uh, on the right is Professor Tarashenko, who's been my long-term collaborator. But uh, we can't do this research without multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams and, and very hard-working individuals. Thank you very much indeed.